G'day community and welcome to the Jock Reynolds Supercoach Podcast. I am Lechdog and I am joined by Dylan, Dylan Bolch, who, if you don't know him, community, uh, he's a part of the Jock Reynolds family. He, he's the king of Supercoach BBL, does content for us. Dr. Supercoach, Supercoach HQ, you're doing everything at the moment, Dill. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Slack. Thanks for that. Um, it's good to be a part of the team. The work that you guys do is um is awesome, especially throughout the week as well. The the um the written content that you know Stady Maddie puts out, Baron, um, the whole crew, Azza as well, um, and Foz with the panic room. It's um it's pretty awesome stuff that we've got going on. Yeah, it's not a bad little operation at the moment. And great to have you here. It's been a while since we've heard from you. Actually, not too long because you did the live show, the live panic room the other day, which was fun. And uh, for those listening who don't know what that is, we do a panic room, a video version of the panic room live before lockout on the official Supercoach pages on Facebook and whatnot. So we'll put the details in the post. Also, shout out to Telebeats for the intro music that you have already heard. Dill, how's your Supercoach season going, mate? Uh, it was going okay. It's going okay, I think. Um, last week it was a little bit of a speed bump, I guess, but you know, a lot of people were in that position. Um, I think I had 16, um, wrote, went with 16 players in the end. I probably should have got Kieran Briggs, but I mean, I'm sure we'll touch on it, on it, um, on it later with Mumford potentially coming back. Um, I think I scored oh, just under 1600, so it was a little bit under. Um, under par, but it certainly wasn't, um, you know, wasn't as bad as what a, a lot of people experienced where they only had, you know, even less than 16. So not great, but definitely could have been worse. Yeah, some of the scores out there were ridiculous. The top scorer scoring like 2,200 is is insane and my brain refuses to understand how that could even happen with yeah. only 18 players, but it did. I looked what? at that team as well. I think he had Travis Boak at M9. I think he had nine premium midfielders, that guy. And I, I, if I'm correct, or I might be wrong about the guy who came first, but I was looking at some of those top teams. A lot of them seem to be real teams, like not teams just made for the buy round. But like a yeah. lot of those upper, upper echelon teams this week seem to be legit teams, which was uh, which was very interesting and very depressing, <laughs> given I, I also yeah. scored just <laughs> under 1,600. But that's all right. I, I wanted to shout out before we get really stuck into the things as well. Marcus Bontempelli's done it. He's officially the number one scorer in Supercoach. He's six hundred ninety-one thousand three hundred dollars. And I'm, I'm, I didn't really see this coming, Dill. I thought he was going to have a good year, probably average one ten to one fifteen. But he's averaging one hundred and twenty-eight. Uh, and champion data love it. Yeah, he seems to get. You know, he's a, he's a, I, I think he's the best player in the competition at the moment, and, and his super coach scoring sort of reflects that. He's, um, you know, in the past, I've sort of steered clear from him. Um, you know, there's a number of factors based on that. You've got McRae, Dunkley, Libertore, um, these sorts of guys, Lockie Hunter in the midfield, and I wasn't initially sure on whether or not there are enough points to sort of spread around, but clearly there are. Um, and he also he used to always seem to be a little bit hot and cold, so, you know, he'd go 120 one week, and then the next week would be 80, so it's sort of balanced out in many, um, in many ways, but you know, this year he's just been, obviously, as you said, second to none um, in terms of his scoring. Yeah, hasn't dropped below 107 since round three. Has only had two games this year below 100. And most of those games have been like 130, 140 plus. It's crazy. It's uh, it's huge in 33% of teams. So we don't need to talk about him too much. But if you're considering him, yes, you can select him. And I think if you're considering any of these super top price players, you can and you can afford them. We're not going to say don't get them. I think we're going to focus a lot on value today. I think that's the best way to attract attack the pod. But are we encouraging people to trade for these Uber guns for the rest of the season, or are we trying to find value? Assuming people have say less than ten trades to go. It it's sort. Of, I think it depends on the individual team. So I'm always big, especially early in the year, on targeting those Uber premium guys. So throughout the year, I went and got guys like Bontempelli, um, Jack Steele was another one. Uh, Zach Merritt was slightly more discounted, but you know I think he's arguably an, uh, an Uber Primo as well. The flip side of that is though you don't want to put too many eggs in those baskets and then end up having to play a guy at F6, D6 that isn't really a premium. Um, last year, I think I got stuck with a guy, I think it was Chad Wingard for the last few rounds. Um, you know, not not a disaster, but in reality, you probably want it to be a little bit more even across the, um, across the team come the end of the year. Yeah, it, I, I tend to agree. Having said that, I've done the complete opposite all year. So 
we don't need to talk about me though. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Let's touch on some injuries first and how they might impact Supercoach going ahead. Lucky Jones, Port Adelaide defender in a shitload of teams. He has injured his... Was it a hammy did he, in the end? Yeah, he did his was hammy, I think. And, again? Hammy. Yeah, hammy, um, which, he, which he injured um, you know, at the start of the year when he was playing in the Sandville as well. So not great for him um, and not great for us either. No, it's, it's not awesome. I was actually out to lunch with someone... The, just before the Port Adelaide game, and he told me he was going to trade Lockie Jones out because he just had a feeling he was going to get injured, and he did. Wow. It was crazy. It was very frightening. That is, <laughs> that's profit like. That is profit like. So he's probably one. Uh, look, most people have full back lines, but if we're looking to downgrade to someone, we'll touch on Briggs and a few rookies later on. He's someone that's prime for the Kelling going to miss a few weeks. One name I'm going to read out before. Uh, we continue because I forgot to put him on the list. Is Mitch Duncan, Dill? We almost forgot him. Yeah, wow. And he's that's a little bit representative of his career, really. He's one of the most underrated players in the comp, I think. So that's a pretty bad oversight. Um, but yeah, he's. I think he's out for eight to twelve. Um, what I read earlier today. So that's not great for him or Geelong. Um, yeah. No, and it's not great own, for owners either. He's had, you know, a couple of poor weeks. 73 and 74, and then, yeah, last week obviously gets really hurt. 10 points on the, from your best 18, and uh, he's he's going to have to be a trade option, I think, for coaches out there because even if he does come back, even if you're trying to be conservative and you can cover him, his break-even is going to be 191, and he's going to lose a, sh- a lot of cash. So he's one that we probably need to move on from. A couple other injuries I wanted to touch on. Nat Fife. Question marks over him this week. He's probably a hold, but there is still question marks. Josh Kelly, question marks over him after a pretty good performance against the Blues. Robbie Gray, no one really had him, but I know a few people did trade him in last week, Dill, to try and get an extra cheap primo on in the forward line, and now he's going to miss uh, an extended period of time. So you'd be kicking yourself if you picked him up. Yeah. Darcy yeah, Moore, sure. last, last week, was confirmed to be out for the year. I don't think we've had a pod since then. So if you own him, he's someone to trade. And then we've got a couple of potential returning players here. The first one I want to ask you about, Dill, is Shane Mumford. If he comes back into this side, what does it mean for us who want Briggs, have Flynn, or even have Briggs? Yeah, so I think from what I, I missed the GWS Carlton game um, this weekend, but obviously you would have watched that one. You didn't um, miss much. <laughs> Flynn, the game before against North, I thought Flynn looked really dangerous playing predominantly forward. Um, so, you know, from what I've seen, I think he'll sort of stay around if Mumford, um, even if Mumford comes back in. I think Briggs is potentially the one that, that moves out if they bring Mumford back and decide they only want to run with two of those three guys. Um, yeah, I, that's partly why I held off on Briggs last week. But, I mean, if he's playing, then um, that's a pretty tantalising option at only 120 grand. So... That's always tough. I think Flynn. Um, I'm not. I traded him out a few weeks ago to Ned Reeves, which, in hindsight, wasn't yep. a great idea. But <laughs> um, he's up around 400k now, and his break even is 20. So he's a definite hold. Um, he's scoring pretty well as well. He's got he scored 90 something on the weekend, and and he turned up the week week before that too. So definitely hold Flynn. Um, watch the team sheets for for Briggs because um, if he is if all three of them are named, I think that bodes pretty well for him. Yeah, I think there's a potential chance they get all, all get named. I think you're right that Briggs is the one that goes out. Flynn looked pretty good against the Blues. And Briggs, Briggs did all right. Yeah, took a few strong marks. I think he kicked a goal. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Hard to judge. Hard to yeah. judge objectively after watching that game. <laughs> we we might have some good news from the Magpies, though, because Taylor Adams and Brody Grundy look like they could be returning this week, Dill. Yeah, which is awesome news. Um, I know a lot of people were keen on Adams in the preseason. Um, I, I don't think anyone would really have him now, but he's. Um, I suspect he's pretty cheap given he started, you know, pretty up and down, and, he, and he's had a few injury injury affected games. So he's potentially one you could look at in the run home. Um, and Grundy, you know, aside from Gorn, he's, he's the best best ruckman in the comp, super coach points wise. So um, great to get him back. Yeah, I'm, I'm huge on Taylor Adams. He was probably one of my first locked-in players preseason. 
then uh, had some injury question marks around him, so didn't end up selecting him. But break even is one nineteen. He's four hundred seventy thousand. Probably not a, a guy I'm jumping on this week, but someone I'm, I'm definitely watching uh, after a week or two. And Brody Grundy for those that held him, uh, we really hope he plays this week. He's going to lose a bit of cash, you'd think, but for sure he will be a welcome return. Let's look at a couple of rookies that are about to jump up in price. We talked about Kieran Briggs. He's $123,900. His break even's negative 39. He's a forward defender from GWS and projected to go up $42,000. We've probably already covered him, Dill. If he plays, you pick him. But what about a couple of these other guys on this rookie list? Yeah, so just looking at the list we've got there, Luke Edwards is the the um I guess the most obvious candidate of all of them. Um, projected to rise the most out of the out of the list we've got. Um, midfield only is a little bit awkward. Um, I know personally I've already jumped on John Newcomb, who's also on the bubble. Um, Lockie Bramble last week as well, and I've still got Trent Bianco in there. Um, but I'll potentially do Jones out, um, sub Bianco into defence, and then get get Edwards if he is named. Um, I know West Coast have guys. Luke Shuey's coming back in the near future. Tim Kelly, um, these sorts of players. So job security perhaps a little bit shaky. But if he is named, I think he's um, definitely one to one to look at. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think a lot of people will have jumped on Newcomb and maybe even a Bramble. These sort of guys. <laughs> At the end of the buys, most a lot of coaches out there are probably going to only have maybe one non-playing rookie sort of on the bench if things have all have got, all gone well. So jumping on Luke Edwards, a little bit of a risk, but I agree if he's named, I'm going to jump on him knowing I'm probably only going to get a couple of games out of him, um, but also knowing that I've got quite a few rookies there bubbling away. Uh, I th- he played against the Blues, debuted against the Blues, and um, well, I'm not sure if he's played in, in the past, but played his first game for this year against the Blues and uh, was solid, but then was really, really good against Richmond was Luke Edwards. So I like him as an option. Luke Foley is someone who has had a price rise. Another West Coast Eagle, $161,000. Break even is negative 56. He's a defender. Maybe a Jones downgrade option projected to go up 45.5K. I guess, is there anyone we're worried about coming back in and taking Foley's spot, I'd, I don't know a hell of a lot about him. Yeah, so he's a... I know McGovern's still to come back, but I think they're slightly different players. And, um, you know, Damo's probably better positioned than either of us to speak about, you know, the Perth sides. But if he, he he's looked pretty clean in the games he has played. Um, you know, whether or not there is a place in the 22 for him long term is sort of hard to read. The inflated price is a fair bit of a turn-off for me. Um you know, at this time of year, as we mentioned before, you when you're potentially wanting to target those, you know, really uber premium players, can you afford to go, you know, a Foley at one sixty and a guy at five forty, or would you rather go a guy at six hundred and a and a rookie that like Briggs who's, you know, fifty K less and a balance it out that way? It's sort of hard to know. Um, but I mean, personally I've got Lockie Jones and Nathan Murphy as my two um defensive rookies playing at the moment and neither of them look to be playing this week. So you know, Foley might be one. I just have to get out of necessity if he's named. Um, given he scores, you know, he's uh, he's scored okay when he's played full games. He has a um, he scored three in the very first game he played this season, I think. So that'll drop out of his cycle um, next week. So the other, he's got, he's got a three, he's got an eighty-two, and he has a sixty-seven against Carlton. So yeah, it is a slightly inf- inflated price, but that average is a little bit um. A little bit of an illusion, I guess. He's better than the um than the average says. Yeah, and he's the. I guess the other thing about him, I job security is question mark, but has been in the system for a couple of years now. So you think he might have a, a bit more uh, stamina than some of these other rookies. Maybe he that works to his advantage, but it remains to be seen. Jai Newcomb, Duke Newcomb. You mentioned him before. Hawthorne player, one hundred two thousand four hundred dollars. Break even is negative 40. Midfielder, I think everyone out there knows who he is. Did you, you've got him in your side. I've got him in my side. What are we thinking about Jai Newcomb knowing that he didn't have a great second game? Yeah, so I think he's very similar to Sam Berry from Adelaide early in the year. Seems to rely on tackles heavily for his scoring. Um, Thought he was awesome against Sydney, but seemed to look a little bit... um, Just didn't quite seem to be um, quite in the game as much... Um, in the SNN game, so I think hopefully you know we're we're 
pretty ordinary this year. So hopefully Clarko continues to play guys like um like Newcomb, like Bramble. Um, hopefully Tyler Brockman comes back in. These sorts of youngsters that you know, whilst they might have up and down games, uh, they're the future of the club. So there's no point playing a guy that's already played 50 games and doesn't seem to be doing much. We should um, definitely be turning to the youngsters. So I hope he stays around. Um, and if he does get dropped, you've only spent 102 grand on him anyway. So it's not the end of the world. No, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, it'd be good to see super, potential superstars like uh, Connor Nash get into that team. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Nash. Don't start me on Nash. I, he, I never like bagging out players from my own team, but he's probably one that, yeah, I don't know that he'll be on the list next year. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's enough said. And Dill, the last rookie I wanted to touch on, Max Lynch, one hundred twenty-three thousand nine hundred dollars break even, minus thirty-seven. Rockford from Collingwood projected to go up thirty-six k. Has played for the Pies. Is he going to be relevant to us at all? Maybe provides us a little bit of a swing set. I'm not really sure if people are looking at him this week. Yeah, I'd probably steer clear of Lynch. Um, Grundy back, that that really hurts him. Um, I'm not sure that he, he'll play in the team, um, especially given Darcy Cameron's had a pretty good year as well. So I think I'd probably steer clear of Lynch. All right, that's the rookie wrap for today. Let's talk theory before we talk players. And we don't have to spend a heap of time on this deal, but we've got nine rounds left, I think, if my maths is correct. Let's. How do we approach our trades from here out? Let's assume you're in a really good position or in a in a fortunate position where you have enough trades for one per round. You got nine trades. Um, what do you do if your team's already at full primo? Maybe with a couple of you know, like an MP at F six. You're sitting pretty sweet. Are you making many moves if you're in a position where your team's full? It's always hard to know without like looking at the the particular team. I think it's one that. You can potentially look at targeting fixtures later in the year. So if you go, I know Brisbane's got a really soft run um, during Supercoach final. So, you know, Dane Zorko's a guy that I think most teams should should hopefully target him anyway. But Jared Lyons is another one who always flies under the radar. These sorts of players, if you don't have them, it might be worth, if you've got these luxury trades, offloading another guy to get these sorts of players in. Um, I'm always tentative to pull those sorts of luxury moves this far out, only because there's always carnage late in the year. Um, you know, whether it's injuries, suspensions, um, a player gets rested, it's it's often unforeseen. Um, and, you know, if you have held trades, that can be where you really do rise in the rankings or, or get a leg up in the head-to-heads because, you know, other players will have burnt through trades and you go from having a, a, a donut to then being able to side tra- sideways um, trade a primo to get another guy in um, and score your points that way. So, yeah. I'm always uh, reluctant to be too um, trigger happy. Well, what what advice would you give someone like me? I'm someone who still has two forward spots to upgrade. Uh, the rest of my team is full primo uh, with a few decent players in there, but a couple of spuds like Jack Bowes at, F- at D6. I've only got seven trades left. Um, I really want to get to full primo, but, but that's only going to leave me with three trades over six rounds. What would your advice be for someone like me, Dill? Um, my advice would probably be like, <coughs> pardon me, um, it would probably be to get those rookies off um, as soon as you can. So at the moment, we're a little bit lucky to have guys like Callum Common Jones who are scoring okay. Cody Waitman's um, been averaging 73 as well in the forward line. Um, James Madden seems to be rolling at 62. But the reality is, these guys at any point in time could totally stink it up and give you a score of 20, which will just kill your week, um, potentially kill your season as well if it's a if it's an important head to head matchup, um, or if you're playing for overall rank. So my my priority is to get rid of those rookies on field um, as quickly as you can. Uh, but the the flip side of that is as well, you know, as I mentioned before, you don't want to go too trigger happy and then be found out later in the year. So as a general rule of thumb, get to full promo as quickly as you can. Um, and I definitely look at fixing up those rookies before you look at fixing up your guys like your German MPs um, who looked better on the weekend than he had in the past month. So I'm hoping he can still end up a, a solid primo, but I'd focus on the rookies before you focus on guys like MP, like uh, Jack Bowes is another one you mentioned. Um, those sorts of players that have scored really well, but seem to be, um, for, whatever, for whatever reason, on the decline a little bit at the moment. 
Well, there's a couple of guys in that bracket, and I'll, I'll name them, and we can we can touch on them. Um, if you're someone with limited trades, it's going to be tough if you're not already at full primo with guys like Jaden Short, who he's underperforming a little bit. He's he's not having a, a terrible go of it at the moment. 475k, just probably performing a little bit under what you expected. If you still got Joe Danaher, he's heavily owned 388k. Paddy Cripps, 473k. Isaac Heaney, 402k. Jack Bowes, 404k. The issue with these guys, Dill, is that they're underperforming. You've got them in your team because you think they're primos. But they also don't have enough equity to really turn them into a legit gun. What do you yeah, do? Exactly do, you just right. ride, do you just ride them? So just looking at some of the names you mentioned there. So Short, I think he's been disappointing, but he hasn't been a disaster. He's still averaging, what, 90, 95, um, 96 and a half I've got here. So he's still doing okay. It's frustrating, but he's, he's not a, a total failure. And guys like Joe Danaher, Isaac Heaney, they, they can give you a 40 or a 50, but they can also give you a 120. So that one is a little bit more, it's a, it's a high risk, high reward one. If you have the trades, obviously I'm not going to knock getting them out, but there's also perhaps a little bit of a blessing in disguise if you do own those guys that, you know, you could get into a head-to-head um, final of some sorts and that could be a, uh, be a point of difference, which could backfire, but it also could really um, really reap, a, reap the goods for you. So they're sort of harder. Um, if you've got the trades, obviously get rid of them, but if you don't, yeah, I guess you just got to hold them. Cripps, um, I mean, Cripps is your guy. I guess you'll be able to comment on him a bit more, but he's he just doesn't seem to be the player he has been in previous years. So, um yeah, do you do you back him to turn his form around? Do you back Carlton to sort of come good in this last run, or do you? What do you do? Do you reckon? Yeah, the 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 <laughs> the issue for me is that uh, you know Cripper talks about how you know we're a defense first team and we're working on building our pressure and stuff, but then we you know. We're second last for tackles, pressure acts, ground ball gets. We're like, you know, the worst defensive team in the competition at the moment. And his tackling, which is the reason I traded him a few weeks ago when he went 10 tackles, 10 tackles, 6 tackles, and he had that 133 game. Um, that was the reason I bought him in. But uh, just one tackle against West Coast. GWS, he did have five tackles, but a couple of frees against and just butchered the ball and, and really wasn't influential uh, later on in the game. So I think he's still capable of pumping out scores like that 133 that we saw, but I'm not going to – I'd be jumping off if I was an existing owner um, and you don't think he's going to give you value for the rest of the year because I don't think our game plan's changing. Unless something happens in the coaching box, I don't, I don't think the game plan's changing and I don't think his scoring is going to come back until that until it does. One thing is he does have Adelaide this week. He averages 111 against them, likes playing them. He's playing at Marvel. Maybe that's good for him. But, yeah, I, I look, <laughs> I'm not advocating people to uh, to hold him. For me, I'm actually comfortable with him at the moment because since I've traded him, he's still averaging about 100. So I got him for value, but uh, I can see that turning very quickly to a point where um, I'm regretting that decision. Yeah, yeah, and Jack Bowes was the other one you mentioned earlier. He he'd be a trade, I think, for me. Um, seems to have lost a lot of that that role. You know, he's been playing forward a little bit. Um, Jack Lakosha seems to have really killed killed. You know, he's he's spot in the back flank. Um, he's probably a trade, but you know, as you mentioned, these guys are all sub five hundred k. Where like, what can you do with them? It's a really they're they're awkwardly priced. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's um yeah, it's a dilemma. It's a that's tough for sure. One. It's a tough one. In a, in normally, I think in a year where we probably weren't hit with the you know changes like games being moved and maybe there's been a few more injuries this year that coaches have had to deal with the normal and people have been a bit more aggressive. Uh, in a normal year, these guys probably become D seven M ten whatever they become your bench player that you're looping. But I don't think a lot of people can have this luxury. So yeah, it, it's a tough one for me. I know in my personal circumstances, I'm going to have a hold anyone that's underperforming. But um, if you've got the trades to move them, uh, we do have a list of bargain players I want to touch on. So just because we're talking about him, I might shuffle the order and we might go defense first, uh, Dill. So I'm just going to move that around in the notes for you. Uh, there's 
four options I've pulled out that I think present value to coaches, uh, and you can tell me why some of these are dumb. Ben McAvoy is number one, $481,200. Break even is 47. He's a defensive ruck player. Three round average is 116. I flagged him in the last two pods because Damo shouted him out as a potential trade in option throughout the buys to cover Brody Grundy. And I tell you what, if you did that, you would be very happy. Uh, what, what are you thinking about a Ben McAvoy and can he sustain what he's doing? Um, it's hard to know. I think. I do genuinely think Reeves will come back for Segler next week. Um, and Reeves is obviously the, uh, the pure Rackman. So I think McAvoy will spend a lot of time forward. And, you know, Hawthorne's not a not a great side at this point in time. So he might be starved of opportunities a little bit. Um, but, you know, as you said, at 480k, that he's in some pretty decent form. Um, I suspect he'll play out the year. Um, you know, he's just had a bye. He's always been pretty, pretty sound fitness, uh, always had a pretty sound fitness base. So... You could do worse. Um, we are looking at bargains, as he said. So forms there. Um, I wouldn't expect him to continue averaging. You know, as he said, he's three three rounds, one hundred and sixteen. I don't think he'll live up to that, but certainly could go ninety for the rest of the year. Um, I wouldn't put that past him. Yeah, I think the highlight for me is that in the last seven games, he's had five scores of one hundred and two plus. Two of those are seventies, and I think that's the the risk that you're going to have is he's going to pump out some of those poorer scores. Um, Reeves coming back probably, uh, I think you're right, it probably hinders his ceiling a bit. But, I mean, if you're looking for pot options, if you're looking for flexibility, this guy's probably a, a, a head-to-head player more than a, a total rank player. But, uh, but yeah. I don't mind him as an option. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Similarly priced is Braden Maynard, $482,000. Break even is 37 Averaging 105 over his last five games for the Pies, he's, it seems a little too good to be true. Yeah, so Maynard sort of really, I guess you could say, burst onto the scene from a Supercoach perspective just last year um, and was really sound. With uh, I always worry with Maynard is that he can play that lockdown defensive role where he has to take your, your really strong small forward. So whether that's a Toby Green, um, who are some others, because uh, I pick it potentially at Melbourne. Papley These sorts of Heaney. guys, Papley Heaney, yeah. Um, that is a little bit of a worry, but you know he's he's one of Collingwood's best uh, best defenders. He's he's generally pretty good um, with the ball in hand, so he's certainly underpriced, um, and and he has got a little bit of history as well. So I think he's a he's a pretty sound pick as well if you want an underpriced player who's um, you know he's four hundred eighty two. So I don't mind that pick at all. He's all right uh, for a bargain, but I reckon this guy might be the one that everyone's going to look at this week if they don't have him already. And it's it's Jordan Ridley at four hundred and fifty six thousand one hundred dollars. Break even is seventy three, at one hundred and eleven on the weekend. And and you were saying pre pod that he was just taking every intercept mark possible, oh every kick out possible. So yeah, it took a lot of kick outs. Um, Mason Redmond had sort of hurt his scoring a little bit um, because he was taking a large chunk of the kickouts uh, from Ridley, but um, Ridley seemed to be taking quite a few again against Hawthorne, which also resulted in a um, in a boost in his scoring. So he seems to be um, he seems to be back. So hopefully, um, I know he's a pretty popular selection, and I think he will. Um, he's a good pick. He's he's cheaper than um, both McAvoy and Maynard, and I think he's better than McAvoy and Maynard. Yeah, I agree. I think he's kind of the no-brainer for this week. But if you're looking to spend a little bit of extra coin, Lockie Whitfield, $516,700, break-even is 99. And I saw him have no one go near him all day long when the Blues played him on the weekend. Jeez, he's pretty good at football, Lockie Whitfield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's um he's one that you'll get the ceiling, so... You know, he could go, we've seen in the past, he can go 150. Um, I think he, he and Ridley are the two standout um, underpriced players in defence for me. Yeah, and round 23 he plays the Blues again, so you can lock in at least one more 120-plus score. Has the Hawks this week, Melbourne, Gold Coast, Sydney, Essendon, Port Adelaide, Geelong, Richmond, Carlton to run out the year. So a couple of tougher games towards the end, but I think for the most part that's a reasonably good draw for him and 
let's be honest, he can score against anyone he plays against. Except North Melbourne, weirdly. Yeah. He does not like playing North Melbourne. Which is weird. And I think with GWS as well, they, they're they right in that sort of, you know, are they going to play finals? Are they not going to play finals? So I doubt he'll get um, rested unless he absolutely needs to as well. Yeah, I think if you can scrounge up the extra 60K from... Oh, actually, I don't know if I would say that. Ridley v. Lockie Whitfield. Whitfield's going to be the... What's the difference going to be between them from here on out? Is it going to be 60K's worth of difference? Geez, that's a really tough question. I think I think we know what we get with Whitfield, whereas Ridley, we think he's back to where he was at the start of the year where he went bananas early on. But, yeah, I don't know. That's a really, really tough one. I've got Whitfield personally. I got him um, a week or two ago after his buy. Uh, didn't score very well against North, as you said, but did pretty well against Carlton. So sort of balances balances that out. Ridley, I was you know he was he was my target at the start of the buy rounds, and for whatever reason, I just didn't get around to getting him, and and he didn't perform, which was sort of a, a blessing in disguise. But geez, that's a really tough one, Ridley versus Whitfield. It is tough. I think you'd be happy with both, but um, I'm I'm ever the bargain hunter. I like to save that 60K, but I know people will be better planned than I am. Let's move into the midfield. Dill, do you want to cover off some of these names we've got here on our list? Yeah, so Lockie Neal is one that we've got um, right off the top. He's coming off in 156 against North. Um, it is North. What did you think of Neal, Lech? Uh, it was a high score. I, I like that both him and Lyons posted really high scores in the same game. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm being biased. Like, I, I'm, I don't know if it's biased, but I watched the game and I didn't really think that he deserved a 156, but I don't know. Am I crazy? I just, he's an awesome player. He had 30 touches. He had 10 tackles. It's good for footy that he's back. Um, can he sustain it? Is my question, Dill, and and that I don't know. He's been very up and down this year. He's had two one fifty pluses, but nothing above, like nothing higher than ninety six. But before those one fifties, yeah. And you know, we're looking at, at the bargains. He's still five hundred seventy six grand, so he's not, you know, he's not dirt cheap. He's still pretty pretty expensive, even for a guy of his, his of his caliber. But if he comes back and, as you say, goes back to that sort of nineties, or even you know, if he averages one hundred and five. That's not great value at at five hundred seventy six grand. No, you need him to be averaging over one hundred and ten, probably one hundred and fifteen at five seventy six k. It is a bargain for Lockie Neal. He's one hundred and forty five grand cheaper than he was at the start of the year. It's just whether you think out there, folks at home, if he can pump out a consistent. Yeah, 115 pluses, which is what I'm looking for. Plays Geelong this week, scored 75 against him at the start of the year. Obviously, was was probably a bit more banged up at the start of the year. But yeah, it's 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 tough to get a read on him. The tackle count is really good, though. That 10 tackles is is probably a positive for those looking at trading him in. Yeah, mm. and just looking, at, we we did touch on earlier that Brisbane have a pretty con run um, coming down the stretch, so. Maybe that plays into your thinking. Um, I, I suspect he's he's probably pretty pretty vulnerable to the O'Connor tag next week. Um, if Geelong do do that, I know O'Connor didn't tag. Um, I don't think he tagged the week just gone, but he has done jobs on on players this year. Um, ben Keys, you potentially get against Adelaide. Um, he could cop a tag against Hawthorne potentially. We've got Liam Shields that does a role. Um, ben Cousins, Dan Howe as well. Yeah, it's hard. it. I think it comes down with Neil. If you think you can get back to that one fifteen plus, get him in. If you don't think, then probably leave him out. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, we know that he can pump out one fifties, but if you don't have him now, you don't have that one fifty. So it can't. What can he do for the rest of the year? And and I don't think. I mean, I might be wrong, and I'll probably be wrong, but I, I don't think he's going to present value at five seventy six k. So I think we can um, uh, probably move on to a, a much cheaper, much more controversial player with the next one. Yeah, so Scott Penderbury, he's four hundred and twenty four um, thousand dollars, break even of negative twenty nine. Um, Bucks sort of said prior prior to be moved on, um, he sort of said that he'd been playing um, in other roles because of a finger injury. Um, seems to be. Over that potentially, uh, what do you think of Pendles like? 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I The reason he's on here is because he's obviously very cheap, but he's also one of the most traded in players so far this week, which is which is interesting when you when you look at his season, which hasn't been fantastic. So from round six through till round 12, he, he hadn't turned up, or round seven through to round 11, he, he hadn't turned up, and his high score was a 78. And he was getting thrown around a bit, a bit behind the ball, a bit forward. It was... It was some interesting decisions. We thought maybe he was getting hidden because he's a bit older. But then the last two weeks, you know, or the last two weeks he's played, he's had a 108 and a 167, 31 disposals against Melbourne. Um, he's He requires to score well nowadays, does Pendle. He requires a lot of accumulation. He doesn't do a lot in the other stats. He doesn't really hit the scoreboard. He doesn't tackle heaps. I know he had nine tackles against Adelaide, but generally he doesn't tackle heaps. Uh, can he get 30 touches a week is is the question. And, I mean, we don't know how they're going to use him. Yeah, and I think, you know, we don't know what Robbie, Robert Harvey will do either. Do we think he'll go, you know, I really want to win and I really want to showcase my skills to try and get a senior coaching gig or really go, you know, Collingwood season's cooked. Um, do we look at giving guys like um, Finlay McRae, uh, Caleb Poulter's obviously played the last last little while, but do we give these younger players an opportunity and push guys like Steel Sidebottom, Scott Pendlebury um, into other areas of the ground where they still have an influence, um, they can still be show those leadership qualities that have made them fantastic players, but um, potentially don't score as well for us. Um, yeah, I think that a lot rests with Robert Harvey on that one. Yeah, and I don't know if I can. I don't know anything about Robert Harvey as a coach. I just like it's hard. I don't trust any of the coaches, to be honest. I mean, you look yeah. at a guy like Pendles, you've had him in your team for the last five years or 10 years. People have always been selecting him. You look at the opponents he's got coming up, he averages at least 103 against all of them. <laughs> like, he's very cheap, but I'm. He's got a negative break even. So you're going to make cash on him, but does that matter at this point in the season, Dill? I just, I don't know. Yeah, especially if you're not going to trade him out. So break even's coming into play when you're looking at trading in a player. If you're getting Pendlebury, I don't think you'd be putting him back out again. As you said, his last two weeks against Melbourne and Adelaide obviously went 167 against Melbourne and then 108 against Adelaide. But other than that, he had 108 against Essendon on Anzac Day was his next best. So he hasn't hasn't really shot the lights out by any measure. Um, no. Nah. Uh, yeah. Let's just leave this one as unresolved and move on to uh, two names. We can very quickly go through these guys because I, I don't think we're going to find a home for them. But, you know, maybe you'll convince me, um, even though I put their names on there. <laughs> Jai Simpkin, <laughs> $524,900, break even of 40. Three round average of 124, five round average of 118. And similarly, Brad Crouch, $529,900, break even 42. Three round average of 135, round average of 112. They're basically the same scorer. They're basically the same price, sub 530K, and they've both got the same break even, essentially. So, do you think either of these guys is worth jumping on for your final midfield position or your second last midfield position over anyone else in the comp? Uh, I, personally, I think I'll pass on both of them. Um, in good form, but, you know, do you go a guy like Jai Simpkin who's He's a good player, but he's he's not yeah he's not a Jack Steele, he's not a Zach Merritt, he's not a Tom Mitchell, he's not a Sam Walsh. I think yeah, if he can, um, I'd be certainly trying to get up to those those Uber premiums, especially in the midfield where you know those names I just reeled off can all go one fifty plus. I'm not sure Simkin and, and and Crouch can give you that same return as often. Yeah, and I think the price difference from them to like a Sam Walsh or or even like a Travis Boak off the top of my head. Travis Boak might be cheaper, and I'd, I'd rather have him in my team than them. Um, maybe that's just me backing in the old boys, but uh, I uh, yeah, I agree. I think these guys are probably not guys we want to target. If Hey, if they're on your waiver wire or for whatever reason in a draft, go ahead and pick them up. They're also, they also seem to both be second fiddle in their, in their midfield. So Steele's obviously had a crouch, and Simpkin, I mean, Ben Cunnington seems to be back in form, so... Yeah, I know. Obviously, you can have guys that score well in the same midfield, but I'd be passing on both of them. Yep. Let's move on finally to the forward line. 
There's more options here than I thought we'd actually have coming off the coming out of the buys. The first one's Toby Green, 471, 100 at break even 45, plays for GWS, and he's averaging 97 for the year. Towed up the Blues as we knew he would. Got off from a suspension, just got a fine instead. If you don't have him, is Toby Green on your radar? Uh, potentially. I think with Green, you've got to understand he'll give you those those games where he, he towers up sides like he did to Carlton, but he'll also give you these random stinkers where he scores 50. So you take the good with the bad with Green. I, I don't see a lot of benefit in moving on a guy like... Oh, I, I think he's similar in many ways to Isaac Heaney. Mm-hmm. Um, both can, on their day, do really well, but they can both also have games where they just... Completely sputtered up, so I think Green's a good option. Um, but just be know what you're buying there. I'd say with Green. Well, we know what we're buying with this man, Paddy Dangerfield, five hundred and fifteen thousand four hundred dollars. Break even is still one thirty eight. Mid forward swing, had a ninety five on the weekend, and uh, I was surprised because when I checked in in like the third quarter, he was on about twelve points. I reckon. Is he someone that we desperately like? Do we have to have Patrick Dangerfield in our team? Uh, oh, I I think yes. Um, he's break even 138, as he said, so he potentially drops a little bit more. Um, he's, he's just a star. So Mitch Duncan going out, I think, helps him as well. Um, hopefully that means he spends a lot of time on ball. Uh, uh, Hawkins and Jeremy Cameron and Gary Rowan seem to have formed a pretty good um, trio in the forward line, so hopefully he doesn't need to spend as much time forward. Um yeah, I, I think Dangerfield's, if you don't get him this week, um, certainly look at him next week. Yeah, there's every chance he hits his break even too. After a couple of weeks back, get the legs, get some uh, movement in those legs. There's every chance he hits that break even this week. Yep. Yeah, Jake Stringer. Sure. I oh. hate to bring him up, but the, you're part of the Super Goats Brains Trust chat. 375k, they talked themselves into him. They traded him out. His break even's minus six and he had a one eighty on the weekend. What, what do we make of Jake the package stringer? Oh, I've still had nightmares for because of Stringer the last couple of nights, but far out. He um he destroyed Hawthorne. I, I don't think he's played a better game in his life. Um he's yeah, well, uh I personally wouldn't advocate for him. I think he's uh I don't think he'll do that every week. He's notoriously been a little bit lazy as a footballer, um, but he's getting those midfield minutes um, and he, he's still impacting the scoreboard. So, yeah, he's, he's the cheapest of the players we've got in front of us here, but, yeah, I don't know. He, he could be a, he could be the Hail Mary that you make at F6 in the last month of the year. I'd, I'd, I'd be cautious of him still. Yeah, I'm. I, 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 the only way I'm bringing him in is in the final round, and I know 100% he's playing. I just am not yeah. bringing him in, in under any other. He's also pretty injury. He's pretty injury prone as well. I, I'd be, yeah, not not the package. <laughs> no, All right. But if you had to choose one of these two guys, teammates, Shy Bolton, Dustin Martin. Shy Bolton's five hundred and twenty-four thousand four hundred dollars. His last five round average is one hundred and nine. Dustin Martin is four hundred and seventy-two thousand three hundred dollars so he's 50k cheaper and his three uh, and five round average are both 102 if you had yeah. to choose between one of these how are we how are we dicing them up i think both are good selections i'd probably go martin um i think you know darcy awesome finals record but notoriously he's been pretty hot and cold throughout the year richmond are, they're in the eight at the moment but if they really want to press the top four um I think he needs to be on his game. So I think you'll get big game Dusty, hopefully, for the rest of the year. I'd be, and that 50K as well could be pretty handy too. So I'd be going Martin, but yeah, Bolton's certainly not a bad option. He's pretty pretty strong as well. Yeah, agreed. Don't think you can go go? wrong with either. Uh, If I didn't have him, Dusty, but I think a lot of people do, I'm trying to find a way to get Shea Bolton into my team, but I'm just not 100% sure how to do that at the moment. But yeah, Gun against my head, I'm picking Dusty every single time. The final two guys are comparable as well that we're going to talk about is Nick Hind, $485,000, break even 70, and Steel Sidebottom, $485,300, break even of 90. 
Steel Sidebottom has a bit more flexibility for the pies, but he's a bit older and his ceiling doesn't seem to be there. He seems to be a guy that's going to score 95 every week, whereas Nick Hind could score 120 and he could score 60. Who who do we like out of these two, if any? Yeah, I'd probably uh, pass on both. I think you summed them up perfectly in the sense that Sidebottom will be your 90 to 95 guy and Hind will be that, um, be that 120 and, and 60 player. I think with Hind... I'd ask people why not Impy if you're going to go Hind. I think Impy's he had his role back on the weekend in terms of Hawthorne trying to look for him as often as possible to break the line. I think you know Impy's oh he'd be let me just have a look at his price four hundred and seven Impy's so he's um he what's that sixty k eight k cheaper um I, I think they're comparable um and side bottom as you said I think he he potentially is a victim of of the the form Collingwood's in, and I think he could be screwed around with his role a little bit in that sense. So I'd be passing on both of those guys. Yeah, the, the question is, particularly in the, the MPV Nick Hine comparison, because I think it's a, a very good one, is what do they, it doesn't matter what they've done to this point, what do they average from here on out? And Jarman yep. MP at close to 80K cheaper, I don't think he's going to give you 80K less in terms of performance. So, and, yeah. Martin's four hundred and seventy two, like as we said as well. So Yeah. Yeah. I think there's there's other and, and Danger's only five fifteen, so Dangerfield's thirty K uh, more expensive and, and Martin's um you know, he's a hundred grand cheaper. So I think there's better options than than Hind and, and Steel Sidebottom. Yeah, and then if you want to take a pun on someone, pick my boy Zach Bailey, who's uh came off a very good game, one thirty three on the weekend. Like if you're gonna YOLO, YOLO with someone fun. That's it, yeah. Good player, Zach Bailey, as well. Pretty exciting. Really like him. Really, really like him. All right, Dill. I think we've covered it all. And, you know, we said it was going to be a quick one and it's going to go for 40 minutes. So <laughs> where can people find you, Dill? Um, yeah, so people can find me on Twitter, uh, at Bolch Dillon, B-O-L-C-H-D-Y-L-A-N. Um, yeah, chuck us a follow. Yeah, great for super coach, great for all sorts. You're you're always doing something, and that's what I like about you, Dill. You've always got something cooking. Yeah, busy, busy man. Well, thank you for joining me. Thank you for t- carving some time out for me. I greatly appreciate it. It was great to have a chat with you. Perfect. Thanks, Luke. All the best for the rest of the year. You too, mate.